again, everybody, and welcome back to Vibeland Sports, episode 26. Welcome back after an extended spring summer break. We are tan, refreshed, our batteries are charged, lots of things to talk about, and we hope you've missed us because we certainly have missed you. I'm Todd Miller, joined by Cassidy Fletcher and Kelby Peterson. Hi, guys. Are you as excited about the fall and Vibeland Sports returning as I am? Man, uh, what a great day just for everybody here at Vibeland. We're all excited to have everybody back, and it's just so great to see you guys back here in the studio. It's been a, a bit of a quiet studio for podcasts, at least here at Vibeland, over the last two months. I have missed it because uh, my takes have been matching the summer weather, and that is extremely hot. So I've got some unloading to do today, and I'm sure we'll get through that. What is it they say? Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Boy, I'm very, very fond of you guys today. <laughs> Don't forget you can join us on Twitter and Instagram at Vibland Sports. Also on Facebook, Vibland Sports as well. We have a fan poll question of the week. We also have several topics we're going to get to, and we'll start that here in just a moment. Anybody in this room do anything fun this summer? No. KP didn't. <laughs> He's getting ready for a baby, he said. Yeah, yeah just hanging out at the house and having a baby around Christmas time. So just uh, doing stuff for that, which is nothing. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, just continue to, uh, you know, have fun here in the OKC metro area and didn't really do a whole lot. Didn't go too far, but uh, had, a, had a pretty good time. Just a, a fun summer. Nothing too crazy. But so what about you, Todd? Had a very good summer. Busy summer. Went on our baseball trip um, through the Midwest. St. Louis, Kansas City, Des Moines, Minneapolis, Milwaukee, both Chicago teams. Um, love doing it. Next year, we're going to the West Coast, trying to see a game at all major league stadiums, and uh, we're going to get there eventually. Nice. Going to get there eventually. Canada, Vegas, but nothing compares to being in the room talking sports with you guys. Well, I don't know about that, but I mean, I appreciate the compliment. What's your number? How many stadiums away are you from completing the... We have actually been to every major league stadium. There are two stadiums we've not seen a game in, Detroit and Petco. Hmm. Several years ago, OU played in the Holiday Bowl. It has been many years ago against Oregon. And when we were in San Diego, we toured Petco, but it doesn't count until you see a game. So nice. we're getting close. We're awesome. getting close. Um, today, a very, very busy show. We have a fan poll question of the week. We'll be posting that on our Vibeland Sports Twitter account, at Vibeland Sports. We're also going to talk about Oklahoma, Oklahoma State football, both with very impressive Week 1 victories. Ezekiel Elliott, about to return to the Dallas Cowboys and be a very wealthy man. We're going to give you our picks for division winners, both in the NFC, AFC. We'll give you the conference championship matchup winners, Super Bowl matchup and winners as well, all here on Episode 26 of Vibeland Sports. I know this is going to end up turning out to be longer than it needs to be because it's old news, but a lot has transpired with our beloved Oklahoma City Thunder since we all were in the same room together. So we're going to give you our thoughts on the Thunder offseason that nobody saw coming. KP and I are in agreement, though. Nobody saw it coming, but I think for the long-term health of this franchise, probably the best thing. As that roster was constructed, in financial hell, there was no way they were really going to be able to add any more pieces to get any better. You might win a division. You might win a playoff series. You're not going to the finals. You're not going to the championship series, let alone win one. I think, KP, you're in agreement with me. Paul George starting to unwind the thread, if you will, pulling on the string, all he did was expedite what was going to happen with this team in two years. And that's a, the thing that I'm kind of, oh, I've made peace with at first. My first reaction was, Hey PG, you still got some uh, ears on that contract buddy, which we're going to talk about later with Ezekiel Elliott. But at first it irked me. But then when the haul that we got back, the record five first round picks in a single trade and the uniqueness of the situation and the leverage that Sam Presti had when he was talking to the Clippers, he knew he was not only dealing Paul George, he was dealing a player that's not on his team that was the biggest free agent out there that was the biggest bait. And that was Kawhi Leonard because he knew the Clippers weren't getting Kawhi without PG. So he knew when he was talking to the Clippers that he had that in his back pocket. So he, I mean, he fleeced him. We, I, I hate to say that we traded Paul George, but we fleeced him by getting five first round picks. And Todd, you made the great point. 
we weren't winning a championship next year, and that's a fact. We had to add, I think, significant pieces, and we were handicapped financially. So that was not going to happen. So I think we did the right thing, and we begin this rebuilding process quicker than I would have liked to have seen. But if we're going to bite the bullet, let's bite the bullet now because we are in an advanced and a unique situation where we can – we're getting a jump start on the rebuild. I think we're getting to this quicker than other NBA teams are. All, a lot of other NBA teams are very, very top-heavy right now, and that is going to come to a collapse soon. And right as these teams are collapsing, I think the Thunder are coming out of the ashes, not just at the beginning of a rebuild. They're firmly in it and in the process. So I, I hate that it happened, but like you said, Todd, the fact that it happened earlier rather than later, I've made peace with it, and I think it's the right move, and we are where we are, and the Thunder team today is very, very different than the last time we recorded a podcast, and I think none of us could have predicted what happened. I don't know that the Thunder will ever win a, a, a championship. I just don't. I think they had their opportunity. I think that may have closed. I think they can still be an elite franchise. I think they can be a very solid NBA franchise in one of the league's smallest markets. You think about the haul that they got. They're really further ahead than Philadelphia was mm -hmm. trying to climb out of that mess. They and we're not going to tank and see first no. picks in the draft, I don't think. And they're better off than Boston really yeah. was. Mm -hmm. And everybody remembers how Boston fleeced the Brooklyn Nets. Here's what people don't talk about enough. Gilligas Alexander in that trade. The draft picks are nice. The Clippers did not want to part with that guy. No, mm -hmm. sir. He has star, if not superstar, Cassidy written all over him. And that is a huge, huge get as much as anything that happened to the offseason, in my opinion, for the Thunder. Oh, man. I, I cannot wait to see SGA in an OKC uniform. That is going to be fantastic. Uh, look, people are going to have to realize he's not Russell Westbrook. He is the guy that's ran this team for over a decade at the point. Not going to be the same one anymore. So, uh, I think it's going to be a bit of a transition period for people, but if you're transitioning, it's it certainly makes it a lot easier when you have a guy the caliber of SGA who can go out there and, I mean, really play a game that's very fun to watch. He's extremely good, and he's so young that... I think he's going to be able to lead uh, this young team that's going to be coming up with all these new draft picks. I'm excited in, anymore uh, about seeing Sam Presti, what he can do with those draft mm -hmm. picks that he's got stashed because we've seen what he does when he has high draft picks. That's how the Thunder got constructed the way they are now. That's exactly right. He has had absolutely nothing to work with in the draft for the last few years because they've been forced to try to stay competitive by giving away first-round draft picks. He now is back in the game, not only on draft night, but to get some big-time players here. I think there's one guy caping on this roster, and it's Gilligas Alexander that is untouchable. I think everybody else, including Steven Adams, mm -hmm. could be moved at some point in the upcoming season. Absolutely. Chris Paul included in that. And I like the move to get Chris Paul here. I, I don't. mean, well, I don't like the move. I, let me take that back. I don't like that we traded Russell, but we had to do it. I don't like that we traded him for an equal contract, but. An I'd equal be, contract of a guy that's breaking down. And, and by the I way, literally it's not watched equal. him break down in front of my eyes last year. It's a year. It's, oh, it's, yeah. a, it's a year sh uh, longer than Russ's, right? Or is it a year shorter I, I than Russ's? I think it's a year shorter. It's a year shorter than Russ's, but Chris off. Paul. Yeah, so it means we're, Chris is getting paid more per season, and he's older and more injury prone. So in that sense, it's not good, but. We're obviously going to move Chris Paul, but while we have him, I hope he's a great mentor to SGA. And it and seems I think like he, he will be. Hey, I've already seen pictures of them working out together. Chris Paul is a good point guard to watch. I remember when he was a rookie here playing for the Hornets at the time, but we got to watch him develop. I just, I never saw a young guy use space that well. Like where he was at on the court, his angles that he would take, where he would dribble the basketball, he would always make defenders uncomfortable and out of position. If he can teach SGA that, just excellent leadership. As long as he's here, that's all he's going to be. Because I mentioned it to Todd earlier. I think Chris Paul is a piece that there's a team around the trade deadline that's going to try to make that extra push. They're going to need that extra guy on their team, that one extra missing piece to make a run at the NBA title this year. I think somebody is going to make 
a ridiculous move and give up too much, and that's where Sam Presti strikes and where Chris Paul leaves. We're going to wait for an, a team to be desperate enough to want him, and we're going to dangle him out there, and I think we're going to get a haul for him. I, I, I totally agree. I don't see Chris Paul being here long term. And I don't expect him to be there by the time the season's over, wherever that may be, playoffs or no playoffs. But I don't think playoffs, but whenever the season's over, I don't expect him to be on the team anymore. Here's what I hope. I hope that Oklahoma City and the state of Oklahoma stay behind this franchise. I think for the most part, people will. I've heard of some people saying, I'm giving up my season tickets because Russell Westbrook isn't here. Well, you're a Russell Westbrook fan and not a Thunder fan. And here's the here's the thing, guys. This is our, We had our first big foray into the taste of professional sports with Kevin Durant. It's just the way it is. We don't like it. Some of us are still mad. Now we're getting another taste of the way it works. Every franchise goes through peaks and valleys, Mm -hmm. peaks and valleys. You look at Oklahoma city. This is going to be your number 12. We've missed the playoffs twice. One year basically is a scratch because they would have been in because of injuries. The other was the first year they moved from Seattle. They were terrible and nobody cared. We were just glad to have a team. So if you want to be big time and you want to be a major market and you want to be a pro sports market, you better stick behind this team through thick and thin. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we're all spoiled, but I'm going to tell you right now, there's going to be some tough times coming, and I hope people stick with them. Well, this was the end of era number one. Of chapter one. And so that's what people are just going to have to look at it as, is this is the beginning of a the dawn of a new era, and we don't know what this one's going to look like. The one before was very fun. They won a ton of basketball games, made deep runs into the playoffs multiple times, and honestly, we got spoiled as a fan base. And mm-hmm. so people are going to have to kind of come back to reality a little bit and remember when the peak was Loud City back when the Thunder were winning 30 games a season. Uh, that kind of atmosphere can help the team uh, come together. It's – uh, it's still going to be fun to watch these young guys come up and watch some different players that we haven't seen in Wear Thunder Blue. I've had all summer to kind of process it now, mm-hmm. but uh, I- I'm excited for the future. Yeah. I think it's just going to be nothing but uh, positive for the Thunder moving forward, and hopefully, you know, the fan base comes along w- with us. Yeah, I, you know, the the players on this team, the roster is going to be different. The style of play is probably going to be different, but I want the culture of the Thunder to remain the same. And as a fan base, we can do that. We have a hand in that. And as a community, we have a hand in that. So I think we all stay how we are, and this franchise is going to be excellent. But again, like I said, the players will change. The fans won't. So as, like you said earlier, Todd, I hope there's a lot more Thunder fans than Russell Westbrook fans. Now, hand up. I'm going to cheer for Russ wherever he goes. He's the number one guy for me but I'm still an Oklahoma City Thunder fan, uh, first and foremost. Well, I wish Russell the best. He has been nothing but a class act for Oklahoma City. I cannot root for him. I want him to do well, but I cannot root for him to have success because of where he's at. Right. Here's my parting thought on this, and then we'll get on to football because it's football season. (laughs) You know how fortunate we have been at Oklahoma City? Nine playoff teams in 11 years. Do you know the Los Angeles Lakers, who may in all of professional sports be the greatest franchise? Yeah, the of example. All time? The, yeah. Eight straight years they haven't made the playoffs. Woof. The New York Knicks, one of the most recognizable names worldwide in basketball. They play in the mecca of basketball. They can't win 30 games. So do you understand how blessed we have been here? Mm-hmm. Understand, folks, that there's dips and there's valleys and there's peaks. Support the good and the bad. That's my point. Yep. Amen. All right, let's talk college football. Let's begin with Oklahoma State. They opened up on Friday night in Corvallis, Oregon, a 52-36 victory over Oregon State, who is not a good team. But you have a freshman quarterback make it his first start on the road at a Power 5 school. And man, was Spencer Sanders impressive. He was unbelievable. So like most OSU fans, the whole talk all offseason, it was 
everybody's excited about this team. Uh, Tylen Wallace. I mean, everybody's got big expectations for Chuba Hubbard. I mean, a lot of people are saying that's going to be the best running back in the Big 12, and I wasn't going to argue with that. And after his performance, I don't know if I'm going to. You're going to find an argument out of me for that. I mean, he's looked incredible. But the question was, who's the quarterback going to be? Is it going to be our sixth year senior Drew Brown? or the freshman, the redshirt freshman, Spencer Sanders. And I'll be honest, I wanted to see the freshman because I say you put him in there now, let him learn. Because, I mean, again, going back to the OSU model years ago, Mason Rudolph was a great quarterback for OSU. I wish we would have played him from day one. We wasted an entire – he blew his redshirt pulling, his, uh, pulling him out to play with three games left in the season, I believe. So we wasted an entire season, in my opinion, of his eligibility. So now – I think you throw the freshman out there. If the t- competition was truly as close as it, they say it was, which I'm having a hard time believing that now, I say you throw the freshman out there, let him go. But after that performance, my only question is why not sooner? Why didn't he play last year? I understand the offensive line was really bad last year. They were afraid of getting him hurt. But watching him play, oh, my, somebody needs to take me off of the Spencer Sanders uh, <laughs> train because I am hyped. I am all about it. I haven't seen a quarterback with that running ability and the arm strength and accuracy play for Oklahoma State. I don't, again, I don't want to say ever because it's one game. I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but I've seen great passers come through Oklahoma State, and I've seen, seen great runners, but they've never been the same guy. And Spencer Sanders, I believe, has the ability to be that guy. And again, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I've seen one game. And your first start against a Power 5 team on the road, I could not have been more impressed than I was. He was very, very good. Accounted for over 300 yards of total offense, 19 of 24 passing, 203, three touchdowns, the key no interceptions. And he was their second leading rusher. And 13 I- carries, 109 yards, and had a 30-yard run from scrimmage. Oklahoma State, though, looks like, Oklahoma State to me. And mm-hmm. again, it's one game. Yep. They're going to get better defensively. But they look the same with a better quarterback. 555 yards of offense for the Cowboys. They surrender 448 yards to what may be the worst Power 5 team in the country. Mm-hmm. They're the Kansas of the Pac-12. Oh, yeah. And the Pac-12 is not the Big 12. And it's not. I mean, Absolutely. it's not a good league at all. But overall, first game on the road, I was very, very impressed with Oklahoma State. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, our basically our team strategy has just been, okay, our defense is bad. Our offense has to be more good than our defense is bad, if that makes sense. And that's kind of that's why we went seven and six last year. That's why we haven't been as good as we should have been because of how bad our defense is. And they played really bad to start the game off. Oregon State, uh, first two possessions, 10 points. Then we get a few three and outs. The confidence is uh, brewing. I don't like – our corners are way overhyped in my opinion. Neither of them played well, and they are both returning starters, so they should have played much better than they did. Uh, that's going to be – how far our team goes this year. But again, that's every team in the big 12. But again, back to Spencer Sanders, the decision-making was my thing that I was most impressed with, with him. There was one play where I didn't like his decision watching it live. uh, We had three guys open and he chose the guy that was most covered, (laughs) most covered and was running a 30 yard out route. And Spencer Sanders threw it from the opposite hash, 36 yard throw out route hits the dude right on the numbers right before he goes out of bounds it was an incredible throw there's also a dude wide open running across the middle i will watch the play over and over again and watched a guy on twitter one uh a guy that's on the inside recap that and he was saying that that's actually spencer made the correct read what the coaches wanted him to make there was just two other guys that were wide open so he's got to he'll learn that to not just look at one option and look off guys and other guys will be open but man I just didn't see him make very many mistakes. He didn't make really very many bad passes, and the ones he did, the receivers caught anyway. Uh, he had a few drops, so that wasn't his fault. And then he on there was several third down and tens where an old OSU quarterback throws the ball away or takes a sack, and he was able to take off and go get a first down and just do things with his feet that other guys couldn't do. And I felt like he tucked the ball and ran when he needed to. I would like to see him do a, take notes of Kyler Murray and uh, you know slide a little bit more, watch some Kyler Murray film because I'd like to see you slide and not hurtling guys as much. But, uh, man, I, like I said before, I couldn't have been more impressed with a freshman in his first game and the decisions that he made all night. He looked to be in – total control of that offense. And 
I mean, I think part of that comes from the fact that he's, you know, been, been around that system mm-hmm. and been practicing, uh, even if it was on the practice squad or whatever. But uh, he just – it looked like uh, somebody that had been running that offense for two years, not his first start as freshman. And it's interesting, too. I mean, new offensive coordinator, so it's not year one in the offense. I mean, Gundy's going to run – a very similar offense, but yeah, new offensive coordinator. So it was uh, interesting to see this, there's a relationship, but man, I am excited for the trio of guys this year. Every weekend, whenever you see an Oklahoma state game, I promise you're going to see one of these three names across the ticker, if not all three of them. And it's going to be Spencer Sanders stats. It's going to be Chuba Hubbard stats, and it's going to be Tylen Wallace's stats. Those guys are going to put up big numbers every week and a really exciting trio that I'm excited to watch for their entire career. Tylen Wallace is probably headed off to the NFL after this year, but those three guys, Guys, I can't wait to see what they do this season. All right, you feel good about your pokes. Give me a record after one game. What do you think? Uh, I'll give you mine. I think they're eight and three. I'm right on that with you. That's exactly. I was going to say eight and three. Uh, yeah, I think they lose three. to OU at home. I think they lose at Iowa State. Mm-hmm. Agreed. And I think they lose this year at Texas. I know there are some OSU fans that are not going to concede the Texas game, no. and I don't blame them because Oklahoma State has not always had the better team, and they've beaten the Longhorns. I think it's a different time in, in Austin, and them having to go to Austin is going to be very difficult. And so we're I'll do- go with eight and three. I agree with that. I say eight and three. I think we beat Texas. I haven't picked out my third loss yet, but it's just going to be one of those games where OSU we seem to have that one every year where we show up and as a fan base, as the coach, everybody just throws their hands up in the air and says, "What is going?" Going on today that we're good good for one of those every year. Last year we were good for multiple of those, but we're good for one of those. What the heck is going on today? And we'll get a loss because of that. I and don't know who that the, is yet. But. One of the games has been against Iowa State. Mm, I mean, don't. Iowa State, especially in Ames, has really had Oklahoma State's number. Probably cost them for playing for a national championship. Oh no, it did several years ago. <laughs> not playing so. for Todd, winning a national championship. Yeah, Two thousand. Gonna... I will never back down from that. I still have nightmares of 2011. I think they would have played. I'm not going to say they're going to win it. We were going to play LSU. Oh yeah. We wouldn't have played Alabama. I know. Gundy says we would have played he LSU. They would have beaten LSU. We would have beaten by thirty. They could not. Brandon, they could not have stopped Brandon Weed and Justin Blackman, Julius, jo- Joseph Randall. Don't get me started. Oh, I could get to do an hour and a half on this. Don't you Got to win at Ames, or you can't you play for to. that You're absolutely, title. True. You're absolutely Sorry. right. Sorry. You're absolutely what, right. I mean, I'm assuming you watched some of it, Cassidy. What yes. do you think for Oklahoma State record wise? I, I would. I was very impressed. I thought the offense looked. That's hard for you and I to say. I, uh, uh, <laughs> not as much for me. I would say. Oh, no, it's really hard for me. It, it's that team south of the Red River that I, uh, you know, I'll never give anything to. Oh, I just I can't do it. Uh, <laughs> and so that's why I have actually Oklahoma State going nine and two because wow. I don't think uh, Texas isn't back. People nope. can tell you whatever they want. They're not. And I feel like uh, Oklahoma State's going to And we go have their number it. in Austin. Yeah, it's, absolutely. I think – I'm trying to remember the last time we lost there. It's a bad podcasting for me to not have that knowledge off the top of my head, but it's been a while. It's been a – exactly. And that is it, a problem we, I, for We might have lost recently, but before we had like a streak of like five or six trips in a row to Austin. It was ridiculous. I mean, when I was in – School there, we never lost at Austin. Yeah, that's and I I see that happening again. I know uh, OSU just plays well uh, down at Texas, and so I I think it's uh, I think OSU comes away victorious in Austin this year. And look, I think that uh, that the Cowboys, if they can just find ways to slow down the opponents' offenses, mm-hmm. get takeaways, that's going to be the big thing for them because they're going to. It's an it's a Big Twelve defense are going to give up a lot of yards and a lot of points, but if you can get takeaways in key situations, That's you can be good enough to win a lot. Our of Our offense did not punt the ball to like the middle of the third quarter, <laughs> so our defense just again, Cassie, you said it best. It's you don't have to be the best defense in the Big Twelve. You have to slow people down if you want to win anything beyond a Big Twelve championship. You've got to get, have a great defense. But for being realistic, that's not the goal for this team. So. Yeah, you just the defense just slow them down a little bit, and the offense has to outscore. I mean, obviously you score more points, but the offense is going to outscore most teams. So if you're the defense, all you have to do is slow them down a little bit. That's all eight we and ask. three, eight and three, nine and two. I'm still, and I will apologize, but I don't think they win this year in Austin. I think this is is the year that they don't do it. But hey, you know, again, there's been plenty of years they've gone down there. Texas was better, and they won. So True. Mm-hmm. don't discount that. Tell you who is good is OU forty nine thirty one over Houston. Houston is not a very good team, Cassidy, defensively. They are a pretty solid offensive team. That Derek King is really a good quarterback. Big time. And I was very impressed the first half 
with new defensive coordinator Alex Grinch's scheme. Oh, um, man. Uh, two, three and outs to start? I was on cloud nine. I mm-hmm. had no intention. I didn't know if the Sooners would get a three and out all season on the defensive side of the football and to, and to open with it. I couldn't have been more pleased with the defense. I figured that the offense would keep rolling. Lincoln Riley, that's just what he does. He puts out really, really good offenses. Jalen Hurts fit right into that system, but the defense is what impressed me the most. And, you know, I said scheme. I don't know about the scheme. I'm sure the scheme had part of it. It was just the mentality. You could tell being at that game from the minute they went on the field, there was just a different mindset with that defense. 100%. They were physical. They were aggressive up front. Kenneth Murray looks like the Kenneth Murray that everybody thought he was going to be last year. Man, was he good. That guy's I mean, a monster. Am I, mean, I ready to say OU's good defensively? No. No. I think they are much better, and I think they will be adequate. You know, you think about it. They were 129th or something in total defense last year. They don't have to move up to the top 20 to be <laughs> no, really good. No. They need to get into the 80s. Yeah. And if Alex Grinch can get them even into the 80s, this team has a real shot to go very, very far. But, again, it's one game. You can't talk a lot about the offense. I thought the offense was good because you got Lincoln, you got Jalen. I was impressed with the defense for a half. I thought they got tired, maybe got a little um, let up a little bit with the big lead. But Houston is a good offensive club. They, they are, and they made some nice adjustments, I felt like. Uh King started putting it on the ground more, not trying to force some throws that he was making earlier in the game or holding on to it for too long. He just started taking off, and that was giving uh, the OU defense some some problems, which mobile quarterbacks have been an issue for the Sooners for, I mean, I don't know, almost my entire life. Mm -hmm. So that was something that I expected when he tucked it and started running. I was uh, like, well, here we go again. But for the most part, the way that Jalen Hurts was able to con- just basically pick right up where Kyler Murray left off, who picked up right where Baker Mayfield, it's like at some point Lincoln is going to have a quarterback that's not this caliber, but I- I'm not don't sure when it. it's going yeah, to be. Yeah, don't bet on it. Yeah, it- it's just – it's. It was incredible to see the throw that he made uh, to C.D. Lamb where he steps up in the pocket. Oh, my God. That was incredible. Oh right my on the money. Just, gosh. Just wide open. Just uh, some of the play calling that they had where he's rolling out to one side and getting him mobile, letting him use his feet, letting him make some easy throws early on to just kind of get into a rhythm. And it just seemed like he never got out of that rhythm. The one thing I've been really impressed with with Jalen Hurts through one game and – He's a proven commodity, so I think we can pretty much know what we're going to get from him, though, is his passing, KP, has gotten so much better. It's incredible. From his freshman year. He was a terrible passer as a freshman at Alabama. You can see he looks much more comfortable throwing the football. Now, I'll tell you this, C.D. Lamb, he better get used to a much different role with OU this year because I don't think the vertical passing game is going to be in play anything like it was with Baker for two years and then with Kyler Murray last year. I think Jalen's going to spread it out more so than Kyler and Baker did, but that's that's not, not a knock. Di- not downfield. Exactly. When I say spread it out, I mean when yeah. you look at the stats at the end of the game, you're going to see a lot more names on the catch list, on the on the receiver side of things. Yes. And I think that Jalen spread it out to, I think, what, nine different guys on Saturday or Sunday night, I believe. So He I th- had like 11 complete passes at one point to eight different receivers yeah, to something start like the game. That. Yeah, exactly. That's that's probably where I'm going at. And the OU, OU's receivers are – I mean, they've always got talent back there, but those freshmen that they've got back there, they've got more talent in that re- wide receiver room than they've had in a number of years, including C.D. Lamb. So I think C.D.'s – he's going to get his numbers, but I think uh, a lot of other guys are going to have more blown-up numbers because of C.D.'s on the roster. He's going to get more attention, which is going to give other guys an opportunity to shine. Okay, listen to this. Ten receivers had at least one reception of Man. those ten – Seven had either two or three catches, and nobody had more than three in the ball game. Yeah, that's he's spreading, that's spreading, spreading the ball it out right, right spreading there. Spreading it out, that's... and that's what elite good quarterbacks do. And I, a point I wanted to make about this, guys, is OU is a great team, but I mean, since Bob Stoops came in in his first year, there's that one something that's always missing 
to get them to that national championship level. They've made it to national championships, but to take them to that next level, I think something like a culture change needed to happen. Something small, but enough. And in my opinion, Alex Grinch on that defensive staff is one of them. I want to get to that in a second. But Jalen Hurts being as mad as he was after that game, oh, yeah. being that's not acceptable. He's like, and it's his attitude about it was like talking to Holly Rowe or whatever it was was like maybe you guys around here thought that that's okay, but in the SEC at Alabama after this game, like Nick Saban will be killing me if we played like this. And by the way, that's how he's gonna his expectations for that locker room are. I hope that after the game, you know, if you're an OU fan, you want to hear this that. They weren't celebrating a win in the locker room afterwards. Jalen Hurts was saying, I got to talk to my guys, and I hope he was in there for y'all's sake, saying, hey, that wasn't good enough. We, I mean, cool, we won, but that wasn't good enough. We're better than this. We're going to play better than this. So that's one attitude change. Another thing, I heard a story. Alex Grinch was on the sideline when things were going well for the defense. The guys were kind of hot dogging a little bit, celebrating. And Alex Grinch got after him and said, hey, we're not – we can't prove anything – yet we were 129 last year like we haven't done anything we've only been on here for a couple quarters stop doing that get out there you haven't proven anything yet and that that's what you want to see because personally i hate the guys throwing the incomplete pass especially when you have nothing to do with it did you guys see the play this weekend it's if you're a coach you would love this so a guy for texas one of the linebackers or something he's uh, playing defense he runs down the field the quarterback for the team throws the ball uh, gets through the Texas guy's arms. He's running down the field uh, doing the incomplete with his arms. Well, meanwhile, his man is behind him because he caught the pass and is running down the field. It wasn't incomplete. So I hate seeing that, and I, that was the perfect play if you saw the little clip of it this weekend. And all you fans enjoy, that was a oh, dig I am Texas a big, as well. I'm a big Alex Grinch fan, and I think you're right, KP, when you talk about the mindset change with a guy like Jalen Hurts. Whether you like Saban or not, the guy's a perfectionist. Then mm-hmm. you can tell that Jalen Hurts has been molded in the image of Nick Saban and championship caliber programs. And Cassidy, here's the thing. Well, he set records in his debut at OU. Jalen Hurts did not transfer to OU to beat Houston. Yes. He's got a whole lot bigger fish to fry. Mm -hmm. And he's going to remind those guys every single day, I'm not here and you're not here to beat the University of Houston. Right. Get better. 100%. And look, I think all the way going back to the spring when he transferred into Oklahoma, and one of the first things that he did, he got into the weight room, and that's how he started like leading the team was by his work ethic. By example, that's right. What he was doing day in and day out, those videos that that they had of that squat video. Oh my (laughs) gosh, the whole team behind him, he's squatting over 500 pounds. pounds. Yeah. I mean, that's incredible for a quarterback. And for him to set that tone that early like that, I mean, he's he was named a team captain, and he hasn't even been there, I think, seven and a half months uh, as of the time of this recording. And so uh, that tells me that that whole team is behind him, that uh, the example that he's setting, and like that perfectionist mentality, Todd, it, it's going to have a positive impact on this Sooner team and – the fact that Alex Grinch reminded me of a li- I saw shades of Brent Venables in I Alex agree with Grinch. you. Yep. Like I, I I saw that crazy look in his eye where I'm thinking if I'm on the defensive side of the ball uh, and I'm gonna be a little bit scared of this coach. Yeah. And I think that's what you want. That's what you want to motivate those guys. You got to be a little bit you know crazy in the head to be a, I'm a, gr- tell you a this. great defensive coordinator. I wouldn't want to be his defensive players this week. No sir. Fatigue, he'll take care of that. And a lack of effort when you get a big lead, he'll take care of that. Now, do I think OU's going to shut down people in the Big 12? No, I don't. They're going to give up points in the Big 12. That's just the way it is. You play defense in the Big 12, you're going to give up points. I just think the mentality, the physical, aggressive play makes them a better defense. I think a good test for this discussion that we're having right now, guys, I know it's going to seem silly, but this weekend – who, who's the opponent this week in North Dakota? South Dakota. South, uh, South Not South Dakota State. Not the uh, the University the, yeah, of South so Dakota. South Dakota is who we're playing. Is who OU USD? Playing. I almost said we. Yeah, the <laughs> South Dakota State is who OU is playing this weekend. South Dakota. South Dakota is who OU is playing this weekend. I think it's a great test for this defense because, like you said, Todd, there that opponent walking in the building, they're nobodies. That this is a great opportunity for this defense to get lazy, to give up some cheap points. 
I think this is a great opportunity for Alex Grinch to get after the guys and say, hey, just because there's nobody's walking here doesn't mean you guys let up. Mm-hmm. You go harder. This is How many points do they score? If more than 20 is a bad thing, and it could happen. There's those two or three free gimme touchdowns that Big 12 defenses seem to give up in these lazy non-conference games. So I think a good sign for the character of this defense, you guys are going to find out this weekend. It is Cupcake City in the state of Oklahoma this week. Ooh. McNeese and Stillwater to take on the Pokes and South Dakota in Norman to take on Oklahoma. One just random fact here that I saw, it was just a, a crazy stat. Big 12 opponents, or Big 12 as a conference, come undefeated, 10-0 and 0 to start the weekend. No way. What in the world? Like The chances of that. Well, I don't the chances know if I've have ever been pretty slim well, because Kansas had to beat like Indiana State. Seven, in the past, they, they had to win a given. football game. Seven period. of those ten games were against non-division one opponents. By the way, yeah, yes. that might be why. There's no still. doubt, the two teams in Oklahoma played the two best teams in, oh, yes. on the slip. Mm. But oh, yes. still ten and zero. You know what? The SEC lost to some teams that they shouldn't have lost oh, to. Oh my too. goodness! So, oh, anyway, that's, <laughs> that's for that's for another day. Again, McNeese State, Oklahoma State, South Dakota. At Oklahoma. Going to be a great year, I think, either way for both teams in the state of Oklahoma. Records. What do you think, Cassidy? Oh, man. I I, I don't see the Sooners losing a regular season game. I'm going to go 11-1. and one. Okay. And I'm going to tell you what game I think it is. I think it's Texas and the Cotton Bowl. Now, listen. Texas is not better than OU. But how many times is Texas not better than OU that they either jump up and play them more competitively than they should or they beat them? Listen, I'm 100% with you because that game, I don't care if if, if Texas has a 100-game win streak and OU has lost 100 straight, it's a coin flip when you go into that game every time. It's what team is going to come out and and just for that one day be the better team and it is it doesn't matter which team has the better roster on paper or what previous anything you throw it all out it's a it's a true just rivalry game where anything can happen and that's the one game on the schedule so it's a great year. game exactly. Mm-hmm. exactly it it scares me though i'm going to tell i mean i'm real i don't know even when texas sucks which I always think they suck, but when they're really bad uh, going into that game, it still worries me more than any other game on the schedule. Do you remember a couple of years ago, OU was a 24-point favorite? Oh, I remember. And everybody's going, oh, no, 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 no. That ain't happening. I just think that's the one game that they could lose. I, I, They've I, got I Iowa State at home, although Iowa State was not real impressive, but you'd much rather play them on your home field than you would up in Ames. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's a cakewalk at Oklahoma State, but I think they have the Pokes number. Sure. I think 11-1 and Big 12 champions for, for the Sooners. And that would get him in the college football it playoff. Would. And Because if you lose to Texas, it's early enough. Yes. You can't lose at Oklahoma State. You're probably going to have to beat him again in the Big 12 right. championship, kind of like last season. Uh, I, I believe that I, – I think the Sooners are in the playoff again. I do too. Agreed. Eleven and one, and losing to Texas is exactly where I had them. And we'll see again. It's hard to say after one game because my initial reaction is that they're not going to make it past the first round of the Final Four, just because that's kind of. I'm sorry to say it. It's the OU way yep. lately. It's get right to the big game and defense, man. Because that's the, the defense, deal. yeah, more than but, the OU way. It's just I, been a lack of defense. Yeah, again, because that's kind of. I mean, it's the Big Twelve way. The lack of defense. This Very conference true. is not going anywhere until the defense all around gets better. So, but I believe after again after game one, they've got a better shot than they've looked to have in the past defensively. Recap: Cassidy nine and two in Oklahoma State. KP and I, 8-3, and three, all three agree, 11-1, and one, Big 12 champions for Oklahoma. We're going to switch gears after this break. We're going to talk NFL football. Zeke appears headed back to the Cowboys. We're also going to give you our NFL picks for this upcoming fall. We'll do that right after this. This is Vibland Sports, Episode 26, a presentation of Vibland, Inc. Hi, we are Vibland. We are a creative network fostering and cultivating growth amongst a community of artists and innovators. Here at HQ, we inspire young entrepreneurs to pursue their ideas and fulfill their highest ambitions. 
from producing albums to shooting multimedia content to our involvement with various charitable organizations within our local community, we seek to empower and spread knowledge through open source innovation. We here at Vibland look forward to the future and hope you will join us on this exciting journey. Create, innovate, educate. Vibland. Welcome back to our final segment of episode 26 of Vibland Sports. If you've not already done so, we invite you to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Vibland Sports. Also on Facebook, Vibland Sports. And don't forget, our podcast will air later in the week. And we have a bonus coming up on Friday. Ryan Engel, the host of Tips from the Tips, will be our guest this Friday. So not one, but two podcasts this week from Vibland Sports. Turning the page now to the NFL of course, the big news for the last couple of weeks has been Ezekiel Elliott. As we record this, it looks like it is very, very close to happening that the Dallas Cowboys are prepared to offer him a six-year, $90 million contract, which would make him the highest paid running back in the NFL. Zeke has been back and forth to Cabo. At last report, he was en route back to Dallas, where they think something will be done in time for him to play week one for the Dallas Cowboys. What's your guys' thoughts? Well, I think I'm going to have a bit of a different take than both of you guys, just from what we've said so far. Uh, I think you pay him. I think that there's maybe three guys in the league at that position that could commend that kind of money, and I think he's one of them. And I don't like it, the fact that... A lot of these players now are trying to renegotiate in the middle of their contracts, but it has showed to be an effective strategy to get more money, and I just don't think you let Zeke go. I think if it comes down to are you going to pay Zeke or Dak or Amari Cooper and you can only pick two of the three, I, I'm to Dak, just X him out all the way. Uh, I say give as much money to Zeke as, as you have to to get him on the team. I just hope he's playing week one and and is the Ezekiel Zeke, Elliott that we all know and love and hope to be a world beater. Exactly. And like you said, Cassie, I think I, I kind of agree with you, man, because I hate to say it too. There's only a handful of guys. I, I'm sorry, less than a handful of guys that you pay at the running back position. And one of them that you do that to is the guy that you drafted with the number four overall pick in the NFL draft, Jerry Jones, and that would be Ezekiel Elliott. You set yourself up for this years ago. Not this soon. I agree. I understand the hesitation there. You thought this decision was coming two years down the line. And then, Jerry, if you're being an honest businessman, in your mind, two years down the line, he's two years older and two years closer to the end of his career. So he probably thought he had to pay him less. So. You know, as a capitalist, Zeke is doing what he's doing. Give me my money now. And, you know, as a human being, we're all in the real workforce. You know, if we all went to our jobs and said, hey, boss, uh, I know I signed this contract with you. I want to get paid more now. And for you to do that, I'm also not going to come to work for a while for as, until you decide to pay me. That doesn't work in anywhere else but the NFL. Yeah, don't but if you're the Cowboys... That. Zeke is a unique situation. He's not just a running back. He's the team's leading receiver as of last season as well. So he's very important. To I mean, he is the offense, if you think about it. They're when teams game plan for the Dallas Cowboys, number one on the list every single week is Ezekiel Elliott. It's not Dak. It's not Cooper. They're up there. Don't get me wrong. And Cooper's higher than Dak on that list. When you're the Dallas Cowboys rolling in, if you're Dak Prescott rolling in, you're a different team than Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott rolling in. I'm a lot less afraid if I'm another team if it's just Dak rolling in the building than it is if it's Dak and Zeke. Usually the Dallas Cowboys contracts are back-end loaded. So if he does end up getting six years, $90 million, off the bat, it's not going to be whatever you would divide that up to be per season. A lot of that's going to be towards the back of the contract. My problem is six years for a guy that's a running back. Mm-hmm. Yes. They do not have that type of shelf life. And not only that, he's got a little bit of a checkered pass with the NFL. Bingo. <laughs> Bingo. Do you think Ezekiel Elliott can keep his nose clean for six more years? I hope. And they... who's to say, guys, four hope... years down the road, we're not doing this all over again? Jerry better have a clause in that contract that if he doesn't, that he doesn't have to pay him anything. 
And I'm going to tell you this, Ezekiel Elliott, everything you guys have said is right. There are not very many running backs in the National Football League that are difference makers. He is. I don't care. It's a quarterback league, mm -hmm. period. And I don't think Dak Prescott's going to demand or should get the money he's going to try to command. But the bottom line is it's still a quarterback league. And I still have a problem, as KP just said. You go to your boss and you say, I want to renegotiate this deal or I'm going to, I'm going to hold out. I'm not going to play. Or you don't get your way if you're Antonio Brown. I'll just go retire. I don't need the National Football League. Let me tell you something. Nobody, to my knowledge, held a gun to Ezekiel Elliott's head when he signed this rookie deal and made him put his signature on that line. Two years away from the end of a contract is ridiculous to go through this. Le'Veon Bell set the standard last year. Le'Veon Bell, though, only had one year remaining on his contract. Mm -hmm. You know what I would have done if I'd been Jerry Jones? I would have traded him. And I would have gone and got a very decent running back. This could have been a Herschel Walker type trade for the Cowboys. Yeah. You get mm -hmm. draft picks. You have a chance to completely solidify your franchise. Now you're going to give a guy who's gone off and pouted because he didn't get his way perhaps six years and $90 million. Who knows at the end of that contract when normally the Cowboys' big money kicks in at the end of their contracts mm. what this guy's going to be. Is he an elite talent? Yes. Do I trust him to keep his nose clean? No. Do I like the fact that he has two years on his deal and he wanted to go to Cabo and not be with his team because he couldn't get his way? No, thank you. Guys, I'm 50 years old. I'm old school. I admit it. I like the way it used to be. I like loyalty. And I am not a Jerry Jones fan. You guys both know that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. My allegiance to the Dallas Cowboys has waned severely in the last four or five years because of that man. But Jerry Jones was damn loyal to Ezekiel Elliott mm -hmm. when he had his dark days. And this is the way he gets rewarded. I'm shocked if this is the figure that Jerry gives him that he did it. Because I didn't think he would cave in. I couldn't have said it better, Todd. That's that's what irks me the most about all this is that Jerry has stuck his neck out for Zeke multiple times and for Zeke to say, come in two years early and say, I want a new contract, Jerry. For Jerry not to, I'm sure the response was, hey, man, I've done a lot for you over the last few years. A lot of teams would have turned, you would have been cut, gone years ago. And with what you were up to, I, I, allegedly, some teams, you might your career might have been over. And the fact that you're coming in with two years left in your contract and wanting more, again, I understand it as Zeke being a capitalist, do what you do. But at the same time, I'm with you, Todd. I miss that loyalty and the, hey, man, hey, Jerry, I'm going to work this contract out. I'm going to play it out because of what you did for me. And then let's meet in two years and then let's really do something for each other where you pay me and I'm going to produce for you. And, you know, it's all about trust. I know that ultimately players don't trust franchises because franchises can kick them to the curb. Sure. So I understand Ezekiel's probably thinking, look, if I wait one more year, they're going to put more tread on the tires and what's my value then? But you sign the contract. Is he worth the money? I'm sure he is. He's a very good player. And KP's exactly right when he said, Jerry, you kind of painted yourself into this corner when you took him number four over an area in the secondary that Dallas probably needed more help than needed at the running back position. Mm -hmm. I'm just not an Ezekiel Elliott fan. I'll tell you a story about Ezekiel Elliott. We had a chance a couple of years ago to sit with Brad Sham in the booth at a Cowboys game. And Brad was kind enough to let us go down to the bowels of AT&T Stadium and watch him do his television postgame show. Ezekiel Elliott was suspended at the time. We're standing literally across from the Cowboys locker room. Almost everybody's gone. Ezekiel Elliott comes out. I don't want an autograph. I merely wanted a picture. He was as rude to me as he could possibly be. I'm not an Ezekiel Elliott fan, so that's probably part of my problem. But I'm also about loyalty, and I'm also about your word ought to be good enough. But again, I'll say it for the third time. You guys are right. If you're going to pay a running back, he's one of the two or three in the league that you do. But unfortunately, the NFL is not a running back league anymore. It's just yeah. not. I don't know what Jerry's going to do now with Dak, and I don't know what he's going to do with Amari Cooper. I, I mean, kick 
Dak's ass off the team. I, if you I have no it. problem with it. Go I, get another quarterback. Yeah. I'm not yeah. a Dak Prescott fan. I mean, I, there I were 33 it. quarterbacks last year that qualified for a full season QBR, and Dak Prescott was 17th. Yeah. How's that for average for you? Well, and yeah. imagine if they hadn't traded for Amari Cooper. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would have been it. Even <laughs> lower. I mean, yeah, but and as, people as you talk said, about Todd, their, you know, the offensive system and everything, but it, it's still when you have a guy like Zeke, it changes the way that you approach offense as a team. Yeah, but as you said, it's I mean, it's a quarterback league. So I mean, shoot, as we're sitting here and talking, breaking news came through that the Jared Goff just signed a four year extension with the Rams. So I'm mean, it's a quarterback league. Literally, the second you said that, my phone buzzed and gave me that news. So you are correct in that sense. It is. Um, but again, I think Ezekiel A does make Dax, Dak Prescott even as effective as he is. Because if you don't have a running game with that guy, he's a statue back there. But anyway, that's my take on it. Uh, Cowboys are going to do it. They're going to spend their money however they want to. I just don't like as somebody that um, helps pay these guys by going to games or watching games on TV. It's all going into the same coffer. I don't like this. I'm going to sign a deal, and if I don't like it in two years or three years, I'll just want to tear it up and just do something different. Well, and we've seen that really, really happen. I mean, it's common practice now in the NBA. Um, Everybody's a free agent every single season, and I don't want the NFL to get that way as well. It's just it's too hard to keep up with where everybody's going and – people are leaving that probably shouldn't and money's getting thrown around like crazy. Uh, the, that's one thing that was always kind of nice about the NFL is you know, that short shelf life for some of these guys, you know, especially they're gonna running their, backs, right? They're going to play out their contract and then, well, you know what, see what happens with them. But uh, this is kind of the new wave of athlete uh, is, you know, pay me now. And if not, then I'm not going to perform and I'm going to save I think they realize they only have so many hits left in them. And as while they still have uh, Zeke in particular, while he still has a uh, tread on the tires, as you'd say, he's going to leverage that. I have that a feeling those can. tires are going to be bare by the time this deal. Oh, he up. may mm-hmm. run it 45 times a game yeah. <laughs> for the next three seasons. And you know what? Maybe Ezekiel Elliott didn't want them doing to him what they did to DeMarco Murray. Yeah. You remember they weren't going to sign DeMarco Murray, re-sign him, and they literally ran him into the ground. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then shipped him off and his career's never been the same. No, it's basically over. ruined his yeah, I, I say ruined I see it, both sides it. of it. I just yeah. tend to always side with the owners, but the owners are not right because they'll cast him to the side to the curb too. It's just hard for me to imagine that what these guys get paid is just not enough. Yeah, that's true. I know plenty of people that live payday, paycheck to paycheck would love to have one year of these guys' salary. Yeah. But they only also have a, a limited shelf life to make as much money as they can make. So anyway, that's my take. I guess I talked out of both corners of my mouth. But <laughs> I don't really – I'm not for it, but it is what it is. Which is, brings me to our fan poll question of the week. Pretty simple. Should Zeke be the highest paid running back in the NFL? If this deal goes through, he will. A, yes, B, no. Log on to at Vibland Sports on Twitter. Answer our fan poll, and we'll give you the results next week. Should Zeke be the highest paid running back in the NFL? A, yes, B, no. Speaking of the NFL, let's uh, talk about our picks for the upcoming season, which gets underway this weekend. I am ready. Absolutely. I've been Counting down the days, fantasy drafting. Uh, I love NFL kickoff. I am so ready for this weekend. Am I hearing rumors we might have a fantasy? Uh, oh yes, league we're gonna in, have a vibe in Vibeland? sports. What are uh, we gonna draft? Fantasy football league. Well, uh, we have to get on that. We better soon. get on it. Yeah, we, we've only got a couple days, but uh, literally well, two. Yeah, we'll <laughs> we'll set that up and we'll make sure it gets going. Uh, that would be a lot of fun. Everybody who's in the Vibeland network or. Uh, who's contributed somehow to Vibland is more than welcome to to play, and uh, we'll be, I'm sure, using that in these segments as we go along throughout the season. A lot of smack talk being done uh, on our fantasy teams. I'll just tell you this: if you hear smack talk from me, you know I'm winning. <laughs> if you don't hear a darn thing, then I'm I'm sorry. I'm at the bottom. Just as long as I beat Bryce, okay? There we I go. I cannot stand to lose to Bryce. I I think that should be easy enough. <laughs> All right, let's begin to the NFC with our picks. Let's start with the NFC East. Who do you guys like? Gotta go with my boys, right? I'm gonna love the Cowboys. I really think there's it's the Cowboys or the Eagles. I think the Giants and Redskins are far distance behind them. But again. 
I say all this with a very big grain of salt here. With the NFL, every, there's always surprise teams every year in the positive and negative ways. But mm-hmm. if uh, I'm looking at the eye test, looking at these two teams, it's the Cowboys and the Eagles, but I am going with the Cowboys. I, I'm, it's the same way for me. Uh, I, the Giants and the Redskins just don't really do it for me. Don't think that they're going to do much of anything. But uh, you'll see me dead before you see me pick the Eagles over the Cowboys. So i uh, got to go with the boys. I'm going to go with Philadelphia. I think it's a better organization. I think they have a better quarterback. And remember what we said, I think they're better yep. defensively. I think it's going to be a very, very good race between those two. I think they're. I think the Cowboys are going to be very good too. But I'm going to go with the Eagles, and that kills me I, because mm. there's not very many teams in the NFL I dislike more than Oof. the Philadelphia Eagles. But I'm going to take them. I mean, if I'm going to pick, I'm going to be honest. No, yeah. so, absolutely. And I mean, I, I think it's going to come down to the last like three games of the season. Exactly. Who can close out strong? The Eagles' offense I like better than the Cowboys' offense. But I, man, I am higher on the Cowboys' defense than I think I've ever been. As a Dallas Cowboys fan, and that's saying, I mean, I'm th- these are as going to be as good as the the Dat Win days, you know. I mean, those Ooh, Cowboy defenses. Yeah. Uh, I'm really, really looking for our linebackers that we have. Oh, Van Der Esch, Smith, and if Sean Lee can stay healthy, man, I like what we've got going on, on the defensive side of the ball. All right, let's move on to the NFC North. This is a tough one, guys. Mm-hmm. Who do you like, Cassidy? I like Chicago. Uh, I think the Bears with that defense. It's gonna be it's gonna be tough. Uh, I think that the Packers. I don't know if Aaron Rodgers is going to be healthy for a full season or if he's gonna have a couple of games like he's had in previous seasons where he just kind of throws out a clunker. Uh, that's really the only two that I see competing for that division title. But I think the Bears and their strong defense are gonna win it out. I think this division is gonna be more competitive than people think. Again, I'm going to pick the Bears. The reason I can't pick the Packers is because first-year head coach, how they finished off last year was just really disappointing. Um, The Vikings and Lions, I think, are going to have bounce-back seasons. Uh, Matt Patricia is the head coach of the Lions. I like what they're doing over there offensively and defensively. So, again, I think this is going to be a tough division, but i got to go with the Bears. The Khalil Mack coming over last year during the season, that was just an absolute game changer, franchise changer in every single way. So I think the Bears' defense is so good, it takes them to that next level, and uh, I think they go really far this year. I'm going to go with Minnesota, and that surprises you, but I think the Vikings have better quarterback play than Chicago. Not by much, but better. Um, I don't think they're as good as Aaron Rodgers and Green Bay at the quarterback spot, but I'm going to go with the Vikings. They have a good defense. So uh, you're right. I think any one of those three could win it. No, so. I, yeah, and honestly, uh, I, I would definitely throw the Vikings in that mix. Uh, Their man. offense is going to be good, and they always seem to just be in contention. Mm-hmm. In the last several years, they just find ways to win games, and they do it in pretty spectacular fashion. So I uh, can't count them out. All right, the NFC South, KP. Who do you have? I got to go with the Saints and Drew Brees. I mean, they are out for a vengeance after what happened to them last year. We th- said it last year, you know, are th- is this their last hurrah? I don't think so. I think that gave them an even, you know, bigger chip on their shoulder to go after, after that uh, blown call in the playoffs. So I think the Saints come out of there. Again, I kind of like what the Panthers did in the offseason. Christian McCaffrey is going to be an excellent player, like the addition of Gerald McCoy over there. Uh, you know, the Bucks, <laughs> Tampa Bay, uh, they're going to be bottom feeders, and the Falcons are going to be good. But again, I've got to go with the Saints, uh, like everything that they're about, and that giant chip on their shoulder. I think that's going to take them very far this year. Uh, <clears throat> going to stick with the theme, and we've got the the same pick again here, yeah, Kelly. Yeah, it's agree and, all the uh, way through. Yeah, the uh, I just I don't know if anybody in that division can beat the Saints. I think Drew Brees is going to be seeing nothing but red for all season. He may throw for a thousand touchdowns. I mean, <laughs> it's going to be just a hundred percent like balls out with them from the very first snap. There's no telling. They've probably had that uh, tape of the missed PI call on just a, a loop in their locker room all summer. And so I, I think they're coming out with a vengeance. And I just, I think, I think they're going to win that division. I like the Saints. I think overall, top to bottom, they're better than the Atlanta Falcons. Carolina, who knows about the health of 
of uh, Cam Newton. Um, I like the Saints. I think they've got a great home field advantage in the Dome. And I like their non-conference schedule. I mean, they've got the same one as the rest of the division, but they're matched up with uh, the AFC South. So uh, I think the Saints, they'll be surprised they end up with home field advantage in the NFC. Yes. NFC West, who do you like? Got to go with the Rams. I just, man, after seeing what they were able to do uh, last season, I, I don't know how in the world I could not can't pick the Rams and, and what everything that they've bring to the table on the offensive side of the football. They, again, a team that can put up 50 points in the NFL it, just at the drop of a hat. I, I, I think that kind of offensive firepower is uh, going to propel them to a division title Cassidy I don't want to agree with you again it's I'm because we've agreed on everything so far I'm going to change my pick last second here because I was definitely going with the Rams but because it's the NFL I'm doing my NFL rule I'm going to go with the Seahawks now I like and my it. NFL the rule I'm about to talk about is that it seems to be there's a every season or so there's a new offensive team that just this hot team that can't be stopped and then the next year there's a serious fall off I would my, the team that's coming to mind from uh, the previous, not last season, but the previous season was the Vikings. Mm -hmm. they had that long playoff run, they kind of fall off offensively a little bit last year. Still had a good season, but not where they wanted to be. I think the Rams, that happens to them this season, and going to the Super Bowl, had an excellent season. Sean McVay, if you had coffee with him, you get to be a head coach in the NFL. He's a hot name. But I think they taper off a little bit this year, but I'm only picking that because it's the NFL and just got to throw a curveball. So at the end of the I wouldn't be surprised if they're back in a Super Bowl, but I'm going to pick the Seahawks to win this division because of because it's the NFL. That's the best answer I can give you. I'm like going to go it. with the Rams, but I'm going to tell you what. Seattle has become a little bit more interesting as of late. Pick it up, Jadavian Clowney. That's going to help that defense against that Rams offense. I just still think the Rams are better overall on both sides of the football, and I think they win it. San Francisco's better but not good enough, and, of course, Arizona's in for a long, long year. I mean, Jared Goff, Todd Gurley, and Cooper Cup, that's a – Tough, tough uh, trio to, to top on the offensive side of the football. I think San Francisco is going to be a sleeper team with Jimmy Garoppolo. We barely got to see Jimmy him for G. what? What did we get to see him for last year? I mean, a game, if that, even that, before he tore his ACL, not long at all. So I'm excited to see what he's going to do in that offense. And they're kind of the forgotten team over there. So I think they can make some noise this year. All right, here's our picks in the NFC East. Cassidy and KP like Dallas. I like Philadelphia in the north. KP and Cassidy like Chicago. I like Minnesota. All three of us take in the south, New Orleans. Cassidy down, I like the Rams. KP likes Seattle in the west. How about wild cards, guys? I'll start. Dallas, Green Bay for me. Hmm. I think, you know, if Dallas does win the division, I think Philadelphia is a wild card. But since I have Philadelphia winning the East, I think the Cowboys are certainly good enough to get into the playoffs. I say Eagles, Rams. And again, I'm going to, that could be changed out <laughs> with the Cowboys and Seahawks, depending on how it goes. But I think the NFC East and NFC West get two teams in there. I think the Packers missed the playoffs this year, uh, first year in the new head coach. But, yeah, my wild card picks, I'm going to go Eagles and Rams, final answer. More than the head coach, <laughs> it's the health of Aaron Rodgers that I think is a concern if you pick Green Bay. And it is for me, too. Green Bay is going to allow Aaron Rodgers to audible a lot more. So I think he's going to take a lot more of the offense in his hands. If he stays healthy, I definitely like him, Cassidy, and the Packers as a wild card. Yes. Uh, I, I've got to go with uh, Seahawks and Eagles. All right. What do you like for the NFC championship game? I've got Rams Saints. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to go uh, Saints, Seahawks. Saints. And your winners? I got the Saints. I got the Saints. My NFC championship, Philadelphia, New Orleans, and I'm going to take the Saints to represent the NFC I like it. in the Super Bowl. In the AFC, do we even need to talk about the East? <laughs> I mean, I guess I it's have a formality. one team written down. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, if you mm. ask Buffalo, New York, and Miami who's going to win it, they're going to tell you the Patriots. Oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's kind of a joke of division. Uh, the Dolphins are doing something I haven't seen out of an NFL team ever, and that's tanking. So that's going to be an interesting year. The Bills and the Jets with their young quarterbacks, I don't trust them at all, uh, especially in a division with the GOAT. I mean, it's just – if the Patriots lose one game to any of the, these teams this year, it'll be a, a disappointment. Yeah, it's, it's just same old, same old. Until the Patriots – 
show that they can't win the division and that they can't make it to the AFC championship, I'm not betting against them. So uh, Patriots, I j- might as well pencil them in for next year as well while we're at yeah. it. AFC North, KP? That is going to be an interesting division this year because are the Browns for real? Can the Steelers is the Steelers locker room better now that there's no Le'Veon, there's no Antonio Brown, and I would argue that it is. I was what a nutcase those. I mean, especially Antonio Brown, that those guys are. That locker room is probably a much better place to be in. But count me in. I'm buying in on the Browns hype. I think the Browns are going to take the division. It's going to be a close division, but I think they have so much talent there that they can do it. Uh, I don't trust the Bengals with a new head coach, even though I like Zach Taylor. Uh, shout out Nebraska. And the Ravens, <sighs> Lamar Jackson, is that going to be sustainable? I don't know. I don't think so. But I, I, that's going to be a fun division to watch. I'll tell you that. If any of those teams are playing each other, I'm watching. There's three teams that could win that division. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I think this is going to be one of the most competitive divisions in all of football and especially in the AFC, but I, I, I got to go with the Browns as well. I just think that they have enough on that offensive side of the ball to really make some the rest of the teams in that division uh, sweat. I, I don't know what we're going to see from Pittsburgh yet. I don't trust the Bengals. And like you're saying, the Ravens, it's a toss-up with uh, can Lamar repeat what he did last year? I I'm going to say no. I think he's one of those guys that has a bit of a fall off. Uh, and so I think that Baker Mayfield and the Browns going to be at the top of the that division. Keep in mind, he does have a running back now. Oh, Mark yeah. Ingram behind oh, yeah. Lamar Jackson. That's going to help him a lot this season if Ingram can stay healthy. I don't watch much preseason football. But what, I, what little I have watched, the Pittsburgh Steelers have looked as good as anybody in preseason. For what it's worth, I'm with KP. I think they may be better by subtraction. I'm going to go with Cleveland like you guys, but I'm I'm very, very nervous about this pick. It's not because of talent. It's that they've never been in this position. And it's different when you're the hunter and all of a sudden you become the huntee. It's different when there's not many expectations on you and all of a sudden people are saying you're good enough to go to the playoffs now. I think they have the pieces. Can they overcome the Pittsburgh Steelers who do know how to win? But I think it's going to be a heck of a battle between those two. Absolutely. It's going to come down to the last weekend or two for sure. Speaking of a division that's just not very good and everybody about has a chance, the AFC South, if we would have done this two weeks ago, I think we would have all said the Indianapolis Colts. In fact, I might have picked the Indianapolis Colts before Andrew Luck retired to go to the Super Bowl. I I felt that good about them. All of a sudden, that division, by his announcement a week ago, has become wide open. I agree. I have to lean with the Texans in this division. But, yeah, it's Andrew Luck's retirement changed everything. I think that Colts team is a good team. Jacoby Brissett's a good quarterback, but not what they would have been with Andrew Luck. And I think this team is probably, with Andrew Luck retiring, in all honesty, it's probably two to three wins less than what they would have got, and I'm including the playoffs in that. I don't think they – if they get in the playoffs, they're a wild card team at most. And with Andrew Luck, I think they were maybe a first-round bye team. That's how good they would have been. So I got to give it up to the Texans. I don't trust the Jaguars to bounce back, and I still don't trust the Titans. Their quarterback situation is a mess. Uh, Marcus Mariota is probably not the guy. I don't know. <sighs> It, yeah, I just don't trust the Jaguars or the Titans or the Colts. So by proxy and by default, I got to go with the Texans. That's kind of my thinking through that division as well. I, I think it's pretty much a dumpster fire of a division. And I think the Texans are just the the fire that's going to burn the brightest. Yeah, and what, <laughs> what were they doing with this clowny trade? I don't understand this. I mean, yes, they couldn't get him to sign, but... Great question. I mean, I don't understand the trade at all. They traded away... Him and first round draft picks. I mean, I just, it didn't make sense to me their moves that they were making. But I will say this about the trade they addressed an area that they desperately needed to address, and that was left tackle. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important spot on an offensive line. So, in that sense, I understand the trade, but I'm with you. I thought they gave away an awful lot. Uh, including a former number one overall pick in Jadavian Clowney. I think first team to maybe nine wins in that division yeah. is champion, and, and maybe eight. 
And remember, Laramie Tunsil, he's a good NFL. He's a great offensive tackle. The reason he fell on the draft was infamously, that was the guy that the, the night of the draft, literally when he was about to get picked, a video of him surfaced of him smoking a gas mask bong. And so he dropped severely in the draft. So he's had an excellent NFL career since that moment. But that was really the, the big negative on him. But yeah, I think, again, Todd, like you said, uh, you project your franchise quarterback to Sean Watson, you make an investment in a left tackle. That makes a lot of sense. But I don't understand the trading away of of uh, Jadavian Clowney because those two moves didn't intersect because Tunsil comes from Miami, Jadavian goes out to Seattle. So I don't understand it. But Hopefully that uh, that's the, what the Texans needed if to all my Texans fans out there. I'm going to tell you, it's too bad we don't have a crystal ball here for one reason. I wished I knew what type of quarterback Jacoby Brissett would be long-term. Mm-hmm. Because if he's very good, guys, that's still a very good Indianapolis team mm-hmm. that all of a sudden people have just kind of written off. But remember what we talked about earlier, it's a quarterback league. And while Jacoby Brissett has been a proven backup, Can he now go out and do it 16 games with expectations? I just don't know. I swear if you look at my paper here, you'd think I was drinking. I'm not. (laughs) I'm drinking Diet Pepsi, in fact. I'm picking Jacksonville. Woo! I think Jacksonville has improved their quarterback position. I still think they have a very good defense. Jacksonville, like Cleveland, though, scares me. Just because they haven't been in that position very often. But I think you could go with Houston. I think you could go maybe even with Indianapolis. Indianapolis not sold on their quarterback situation. And as KP alluded to earlier, I think that's why the Titans aren't a factor because they are unsettled at the most important position. Yes. And and going back to the Colts a little bit, just having that kind of bombshell dropped on your team, I think just going to, they're going to be playing a little bit. I don't know, different. There's going to be something missing. It's going to affect at least early on in the season. All the questions are going to be, well, how is you, how are you doing this without luck? Or what was it like without luck? And I, it's going to be a distraction. And I, I think for that reason, um, uh, that's why I can't put them very high. But other than that, I, I think other than the quarterback position, they have a chance to be very good. AFC West. Who do you like Cassidy? I got to go with the Chiefs. I think that they have established themselves as a perennial contender now, and I'm excited to see the Patty Mahomes and the Chiefs get after it again and go out there, and I think they can do it. I think they can win the division over the Chargers, who I think are very, very good. I totally agree with you. I think it's up to the Chiefs or the Chargers. That's who's playing for this division, and the Chiefs are kind of – I mean, they're the hot offense of the NFL, and I don't think they cool down at all. Patrick Mahomes is one full season in the NFL, and he just leaves with the MVP. I think pretty solid. Yeah, pretty solid season there for old Patty. So I think they pick up right where they left off. Um, I think they learn from their mistakes, and they uh, go a little bit further in the playoffs this year than they did last year. I'm going to tell you what, the Chargers are really, really good. In fact, a lot of publications have them picked to beat Kansas City in the West. I'm still going to go with the Chiefs. I, I have some question marks with Kansas City. Is Mahomes as good as he was last year? No way. I mean, you can't be that good a second year in a row. He could go from being historic to ridiculous. He's still going to That's be still, out of this world good. True. But I think he takes a little bit of a step back. I think the Chiefs do a little. But the Chargers seem to have a Kansas City problem. When it comes right down to it, they cannot beat the Chiefs. They did win at Arrowhead last year, but by and large, you look historically, the Chargers have had problems against Kansas City, so I do like the Chiefs to win the West. My wild card picks, Pittsburgh and the Chargers. I think my wild card picks in the AFC are a lot like my wild card picks in the NFC. The Cowboys could win a division. Philadelphia would get the wild card. Green Bay could win a division. Maybe Minnesota gets a wild card. The Chargers could win the West. Kansas City would get the wild card. Pittsburgh and Cleveland, likewise, in the north. But I'm going to go with the Steelers and the Chargers in the wild card. I also have the Chargers, and I have the Ravens. Uh, I think they're going to you know, just outpace the Steelers in that division, but I do think that uh, it's going to come from the west and the north are both going to get two teams in this year. I agree. I'm on the same boat with Todd, though. I'm going to Chargers – and the Steelers, the Steelers. 
coming in for the wild card there. AFC Championship game. Kansas City, New England for me. And I like the Chiefs to finally get over the Patriots' hump. Ooh. They may have to do it, though, in Foxborough because the Patriots' schedule with that division is pretty soft. But I like the Chiefs. I just think this is the year that they finally get rid of Tom Brady. Yeah. Okay. As their problem. As their problem. Okay. Nobody's problem. ever going to get rid of Tom Brady. He'll he may, play when he's 73. I was going to say, yeah, he may be still playing when the NFL like ends as an organization. I've got the same matchup, Todd, Chiefs and the Patriots, and I'm just so back and forth on this because my gut tells me the Chiefs are the new team. They're the hot team. That's who you go with. That's who you pick. But then my brain tells me, hey, it's hard dummy, to go against Brady. you can't pick against Tom Brady. How many times have you told yourself there's – record on this podcast of me telling myself hey don't pick against brady and i did and then i was wrong and then he goes on to win the super bowl again so i let's just let's go with the brain here unfortunately and i'm gonna go with the patriots uh edging out the chiefs just barely in the afc i think there's nothing wrong with that pick because i would have thought the chiefs would have beaten the patriots last year at home i really did so I, i have that same matchup and i i have the patriots like i said uh until they show that they can't make it to the Super Bowl from the AFC, then I cannot, in good faith, bet against them or pick against them. It's just, I think it is, uh, I think the Patriots are going to are gonna get back to the Super Bowl for the 500th time this decade. In my opinion, there's just three teams that can make it to the championship. Two of them are the Chiefs and the Patriots. Mm-hmm. The other, in my opinion, is the Chargers. Yes. So, all right. How about the Super Bowl? I've got the Saints and the Chiefs. Part of that is I'd love to see that matchup. Oh, I like both great. of those teams. And I'm going to go with New Orleans to finally get it done after the disappointment of last year. I've got Saints versus the Patriots. And I'll say it again. I cannot bet against Tom Brady. Uh, I, just, I think that... The Patriots are are going to do it again. They they are the unstoppable force in the NFL until proven otherwise. And I, I, same thing as you, Cassie. I've got the Saints and Patriots, and I'm in the exact same situation where as I was in the last round. My gut's telling me the Saints are a team this year that's got a bigger chip on their shoulder than anybody else. I think when we look at the Saints at the end of the year, their point differential is going to be extremely high, much higher than anybody else in the NFL. I think they're going to blow teams out this year. They're not going to take their foot off the gas because they're not going to leave the game to the refs. They're going to leave the game to let's let's win by two scores at a minimum. So I think they're going to blow through teams this year. That being said, my brain's telling me again, can't bet against the Patriots until they lose, and they haven't proven me any reason not to bet against them. So my final pick is Patriots Saints with the Patriots winning the Super Bowl. All right, let's recap our AFC picks. All three of us agree on New England of the East, Cleveland in the North. Cassidy and KP like Houston. I believe that's right. I like Jacksonville in the South. We all three like Kansas City in the West. My wild card, the Chargers and Pittsburgh. AFC Championship game, Kansas City, New England. You guys like New England. I like the Chiefs, and a Super Bowl champion for me is New Orleans. You guys both like New England, and who can uh, fault you on that pick as well? I do have a little bit of a problem with Drew Brees. Drew Brees is really starting to show his age. His arm strength is nowhere near what it was two years ago even. That's a question mark for me for New Orleans, but I still think they're the class of the NFC, especially if they get home field advantage in the playoffs again, and I just think maybe this is their year. Yeah, Uh that and I live with a Saints fan. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, I, I'm a huge Drew Brees fan. Uh, Love the guy. Probably my favorite quarterback in the NFL right now. And uh, it's, man, I, I really, really hope for his sake that they're able, if it's not the Cowboys that, in the NFC, then I'd like for the Saints to get it. I was talking about trios earlier in college football, how excited I was to watch the trio at Oklahoma State. But I'll tell you about a really good NFL trio, and that's Drew Brees, Michael Thomas, and Alvin Kamara. Those guys are going to be exciting to watch. And if you're into fantasy football, you're not going wrong with any three of those guys on your roster. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't mind seeing the Chargers there as well because I really like Phillip Rivers. I really like Phillip Rivers, but I just don't know that they can get over their problem with the Chiefs. So that's our NFL picks for 2019. I know this, guys. There's more parity in the league probably than there's ever been. It's going to be an exciting fall, and it all starts this coming weekend. I can't wait. All right. Speaking of the NFL, one more time, don't forget about our fan poll question of the week. Should Zeke be the highest paid running back in the NFL? A, yes. 
be no log on to our twitter poll at vibeland sports on twitter and of course you can follow us at that address on instagram as well and vibeland sports on facebook another reminder coming up friday we have a bonus podcast for you from vibeland sports ryan engel the host of tips from the tips will join us and that'll be a great interview did that back in the spring and looking forward to hearing from ryan engel You'll want to know about him. You'll want to play golf with him after you know him and and watch some videos of him as well. Definitely. Man, guys, it's good to be back together. Absolutely. So much fun. Loved it. I've got a lot of uh, venting off my chest here. So a lot of (laughs) you guys are calming me down about my OSU hype, and I've uh, mourned and got over and moved on, and I'm ready for a new day for the Thunder. So uh, looking forward to an exciting 2019-2020 sports year. Yeah, it was uh, a bit of a rough sports summer i would say especially as a thunder fan uh that wasn't a whole lot going for really any of the teams that I, that i root for but i'm excited that now that football is back and i, I just can't wait to continue to see you guys every week that's going to wrap up ex- episode 26 of Vibland sports hope you'll join us back here again next week for kelby peterson and cassidy fletcher i'm todd miller Vibeland Sports is a weekly presentation from Vibeland Inc.